project works, and it just kept saying this is all one. I'm not sure why. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry that this is projectors. It doesn't work, and uh, I made a phone call. Someone will come to fix that. So perhaps we'll have to endure this empty screen. Mm -hmm. uh, half of time, of, uh, that's, the, that's the optimistic uh, expectation. Uh, if you want to endure half time of the class for this screen. So, um, uh, so first, uh, um, uh, the first announcement is that the midterm uh, exam grade is uh, uh, uploaded in the cameras. And maybe some of you have noticed that uh, you can check out grade on the cameras. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, per request for some of you, I would like to share uh, some statistics uh, about midterm exams. Uh, that is before the, before the curve, the grades. So that's the original grade. So it looks like uh, the results are not uh, very promising. I found the, uh, I found most uh, most of you do, did not finish the last problem. So uh, you still remember the last problem is just a domestic yeah. bound proof for some uh, slightly changed version of perception. Right? So uh, so so I would like to know uh, what's the reason. It, it is because it's probably too hard, or it's because you don't have to finish that problem. Uh, I would say that the problem was definitely harder, um, but also I was, I was writing well on time by the time I got to it, so I didn't have enough time to sit and think and figure out everything. So I, a combination of it was a hard problem and I was writing well on time. I couldn't figure it out. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we found it hard to concentrate. So hard to concentrate, why? We were doing exam. Oh, the time. All the time. I think also a lot of it was, um, for me at least, like more memory based. Like the other things I could remember, like you do these steps to build a decision tree or something like that. But for the perceptron one, it was a lot of like me sitting there trying to remember the slides and exactly what the different steps were and how they change. And when you're already low on time, then you're like a little too stressed to remember, oh, what was this slide versus the next slide? Like, you know, you miss those little steps. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't want to say, but I honestly just couldn't remember the specifics for how to get from one step to the next. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I would agree. It's kind of the same principle that um, the other problems you could figure out based on the principles that you learned, while the other ones you kind of had to memorize. Mm -hmm. And given all the material we had to, to study, I didn't take the time to, to memorize those slides in particular. And I'll add to that even like I took some time to try and memorize the slides, you know, like I even made like little um, like flashcards before, you know, to, like go over the steps of the perceptron and like all of that. And even still, like just those little tweaks, like even if I could remember the big ideas of like, oh, you're supposed to prove it in these ways, having the, the changes that we had, it was just, um, it was one of those things where like even if you memorize it, you have to put in a lot more thought. And so that was part of it for me too. Okay. Yeah, like I I remember going through the like the proof of that mistake down theorem for the perceptron, and I got to the point where I could like write it down, but it was mostly just from from memory, and I was still having a hard time grasping like the concepts of why, like how the proof moved. Um, I so see. like I didn't understand it enough conceptually. I don't think. I see. Yeah. I was gonna say apparently the concept wasn't there for me because. I studied, like that was the last thing I reviewed and I studied it for like, made sure like an hour before class that I could do the proof. Mm -hmm. Thought I understood it. Even after the test, I actually, that was the only problem I felt confident with and that's how I got scored. <laughs> <laughs> so we should, I guess some review would be, or, or even just feedback on that problem, what you were looking for would be helpful. Okay, so it looks like, uh, uh, there are two factors. Is a, one is about the time. That is about the hardness. It looks like hardness is uh, with more. Right. Okay. Um, well, um, that's uh, different from uh, my understanding. Uh, so actually, we have spent uh, almost three classes to discuss the proof, missing bound theory, and proof of law perception, right? And uh, we uh, we go through each step and I show each. Each step of proof uh, on the whiteboard. 
So uh, <coughs> I thought this uh, proof is a really, really simple, right? It's a, if you can. Huh? Okay, sorry, I'm just wondering if the, it's possible to get a step point that I made a mistake in the very first one. <laughs> Excuse me? It, for the for the for the for the last uh, for the uh, m uh, mistake bound uh, problem, uh -huh. I made I <laughs> made a mistake in the very first step, and uh, all the all the rest of it is based off the. I think it's yeah. correct. It's based off the oh, first one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the the, the, the problem is designed to uh, help you to guide you to make progress until you finish the proof. That's that's where your are connected. You're trying to fix this. Right? Yeah, that is pretty much. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the temperature line just flashed. Right? So, yeah. so. Um, okay, so uh, here, here I, I want to give you uh, some suggestion. So, uh, uh, as you may have uh, noticed that uh, for some proof, uh, I'm not trying to just uh, follow the slides, right? I'm trying to finish the proof with you together on the whiteboard. One side, uh, every time when I begin to do that, it means that uh, this proof is important. So I really uh, encourage you to <coughs> derive this proof, to finish the proof after the class. And the best way to memorize that is to do it yourself. Right? It's not to just uh, um, straight force yourself to memorize that like in minutes. Actually, you try you, you, after after class. You should try to uh, throw out the slides. Just uh, look at the theorem, and you can you you should ask yourself whether I can do the proof on myself, whether I can finish the proof on myself. Right. So if you can do that, that's a good indicator showing that you not only understand it, you memorize it. This is uh, this is the one way. I think the best way to uh, master those theorems, also the tricks to develop those uh, theorems. So um, um, again, uh, as I emphasized many times, so uh, after class, I really hope you not to just review the slides. Try to write down this proof by yourself. Try to uh, Keep the proof by yourself. If you if you if you're stuck if you are stuck by some point, that's the good point. That's the way. That's the uh, that's where you know you are actually not understanding. So uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, here I want to share a few statistics. So the highest the highest score is uh, the total score is one hundred. So 
um, the one who get is for uh, violations, you're doing a uh, one for job, and you're one of the several students who uh, almost uh, solved the last problem. So it's really good. And, but the median score is uh, only 64, and average score is 66. So uh, uh, here's the distribution of the scores. So uh, one third of the papers, uh, the scores are below 60. That's not, uh, that's not very uh, promising. And then uh, four students, or 13% of the papers on grades over 80. So uh, uh, congratulations, you're doing an awesome job. And then uh, 27% of papers uh, got grades between 60 and 70. This, uh, this is uh, fair. And uh, uh, another 27% of papers uh, have the grades between 70 and 80. That's good. So uh, uh, again, this, uh, this, uh, this grades are before a curve. And the, the final grades will be uh, a little different from, uh, will be different from this. Um, uh, that, that reminds me to uh, 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 make some survey on Wednesday. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will work on some surveys on uh, Wednesday and to collect your feedbacks about uh, the teaching, the way to interact with you, and uh, the way to deliver content, and also the uh, a range of the, uh, the, 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 the the exam content. And I hope I can get our feedbacks and uh, adjust accordingly, and hope uh, I really hope uh, every of you, after this class, can get A or A plus. At the same time, uh, you feel that you will really get what you want to learn from this class. You, you feel you, you learn something, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my plan. So, any question about this mission now? Uh, but again, um, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, because. Because in all my uh, in, in, in exams, including the final exams, I wouldn't ask you to look at uh, extra materials, extra books. I think that's a kind of uh, a waste of time, right? Are solutions available for the midterm anywhere that we can view? Um, that might be helpful. Uh, if you if you if you really want the solutions, yes, I can ask the TAs to uh, uh, to to publish the solutions. Okay. And. Um, uh, here's my uh, requirement. I, I would ask you to, for the final exam, I would ask you to uh, look at any extra materials. All the exam materials are in the slides. And so uh, I think this is a way to make you happy, right? It's not, uh, you, you are not necessary to look at extra books, but you, you really need to understand uh, every details in the slides, uh, namely uh, all the points we have discussed uh, in the class show on the blackboard. So uh, uh, don't uh, just uh, look at what I have derived here and uh, say, OK, I, I get a point. I understand it. That's a kind of superficial. You should do it by yourself. This is the best way to, uh, this is the best way to, to review um, the, the content. Right? And although I have, a, uh, I have given some um, uh, problem assignments and, and enforce you to review this concept and then force you to implement the learning algorithms to uh, deepen your understanding and to to make you to enforce you to have some impressions on the content but but uh, I cannot give you like 100 problems to cover every point we have discussed so far right so you need to look at the slides you need to review them and you need to <coughs> try to derive everything by yourself this is the best way to uh, to understand everything because in machine learning is different. Uh, it, it's kind of a mixture between the uh, uh, practice and uh, theory. Right? We we need to implement the practical algorithm to make it work, to uh, to apply for your own problems. At the same time, you need to derive a lot of things. We have we have some theoretical framework to show some guarantees about our learning algorithms. It is also important for you to capture those frameworks. So this is uh, this this is all about uh, I guess this is all about the uh, midterm uh, exam, and uh, uh, the second uh, announcement is is that the uh, the homework three has been uh, released today. So uh, 
uh, uh, Dora Tumbo 3 only contains like three or four problems, very small, has no pro pro programming assignments. So the motivation for homework three, which is published in media after spring break, helps you to review the computation learning theory we have discussed so far, right? Because we have a gap, we have a gap for the spring break, so we need to catch up and we need to um, proceed our course content, right? So because uh, there are, uh, because uh, there are so few problems, so I will give you ten days. So don't delay and uh, try to do the problems um, right now. And this is a, this is a good way of review everything and to um, to continue. Um, our course content. Right? And the third, uh, the third thing um, is about the cross project. So in, uh, in this week, we will finish the reading of midterm uh, um, uh, project report. And uh, but I, 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 I want to emphasize that uh, uh, our final project report uh, will have much more. Will have will have much more requirements on the final project report. So as you have, uh, you may have noticed that after spring break, the final of the semester is fast approaching. Okay. So uh, 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 if you, if you, if your current program still stays in a very initial st status, you need to accelerate. Uh, you need to accelerate. You need to make some big progress because in the final project, uh, you are required to provide thorough, thorough experiment result. You need to verify your idea. Use your data, right? And you need to justify the result. You need to explain. Uh, you need to explain to me why your proposed method works, right? How can you verify it you using some um, um, uh, carefully designed experiment? Right? So if you uh, if, if if the final project uh, still um, <coughs> just contains some preliminary results, that's not uh, that's, that's not what we would expect. you 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 won't get satisfactory grade. So, uh, any any question? Mm -hmm. Will the final exam include also the lesson material? No, no. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, final. Uh, the content of midterm exam and the final exams are totally uh, not overlapping. So I do all all the cover. Uh, oh, um. It might have, it might have our because uh, because in midterm exam we only uh, check our basic understanding about like path learning, right? But uh, we have talked a lot of things about uh, the path learning framework, path learnability, and uh, uh, sample complexity uh, guarantees, and those kind of stuff. That might be uh, uh, that that might appear in the uh, final exam. Any other questions? Okay, great. So, uh, let us start the uh, course content. So uh, today we're uh, gonna keep uh, keep talking about the uh, computational learning theory, and uh, we'll start a new topic of agnostic learning. So uh, before we introduce what is agnostic learning, uh, let us uh, briefly review what we have discussed so far in the computational learning uh, framework, right? The theory framework. So at the very beginning, uh, we we introduce the basic frameworks for Generalization, generalization theory, right? So, um, first we, we should be clear about the motivation for us to develop the computational learning theory. So, uh, what's the motivation for the computational learning theory? And I'm here. Uh, so, so, remember, whenever we are talking about some topics, some algorithm, we need to first be clear about the motivation, right? Otherwise, you're just trying to um, memorize something without knowing why. It's, it's not good, right? So, what's the motivation for us to develop a computational learning theory? So, 
we have some guarantee about our the algorithms we use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so more directly, we're trying we we want to evaluate the performance of our learning algorithm, right? So uh, previously we have spent several weeks talking about misty driven learning algorithm, right? This is a, a typical type type of online learning algorithm, right? So how can we evaluate the mystic driven learning algorithm? We use the number of mistakes during the learning procedure, right? So the less number of mistakes you make in the learning procedure, the better the learning algorithm, right? So but obviously there are other types of learning algorithms like batch learning algorithm. Then how can we evaluate the goodness of batch learning algorithm? And also, do you think simply counting the number of mistakes during the learning procedure is not very natural, right? So at least for me, when I try to, when I uh, begin to learn those machine learning content for me, I think I think it's not very, very straightforward, very intuitive, right? How can you evaluate the learning, your, your learner's performance? I think the most uh, straightforward way is that after the learning, what's the, perform what's the prediction performance of your learned classifier, right? Or how about this? And then, that's the motivation for us to develop computation learning theory, right? How can we straightforwardly uh, evaluate your learning algorithm's performance? That is, uh, we test our learned hypothesis or have our classifier using those future unseen test examples, right? So the smaller those kind of uh, generation error, the better your learning algorithm, right? So this is actually essentially another way to evaluate the learning performance. And then, the goal of our computational learning theory is to give a mathematical characterization, a characterization about the generation performance, right? Given your performance on the training data. So after the learning, you, you get some training error, you get some performance. Using your learned hypothesis or classifiers on the training data, and how can we guess or how can we derive the possible range of the generalization error. That is using your learned hypothesis or classifiers to predict the future and same examples. That's the question we want to address using computational learning theory, right? And then so this is this is the goal or the motivation for developing computational learning theory. And then what kind of uh, uh, guarantees can we make about your learned hypothesis or classifier? This is the second thing we should be we should be able to keep in mind because why? Because uh, when you try to review the computational learning theory framework, we will say all the theorems, all the conclusions are very tedious, right? But why it is so tedious? Why you have to use so long sentences to describe a conclusion? Why? Can we give some deterministic uh, deterministic uh, guarantee about the generation performance? Say. After your learning is finished, I can I am sure that your hypothesis, the learned hypothesis, will have a less than one percent generation error. Can we do that? No, right? Why? Because your learned hypothesis not only depends on a learning algorithm with some specific hypothesis space, but also depends on training data. Right? We cannot control. What kind of training data, what, what set of training data we're going to use, right? The training data is assumed to be sampled from some unknown data distribution, unknown mechanism, which could be highly complicated. We do not know that, right? So that, that means your learned hypothesis, your, 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 your output of your learning algorithm, actually highly depends on training data. Right? Now that the training data has some randomness, then your hypothesis has some randomness. Then using a hypothesis to predict the future of things, in examples, this generation error will have some randomness as well, right? That's why we cannot give some deterministic guarantee about your generation performance. To describe that, we can only use some probabilistic language, right? We can only say, okay, with some high probability, our generation performance, uh, our generation error will be less than some level. That's the only way we can assert 
the performance of our learning algorithm. And by understanding this point, we can see why our path learning results are so tedious. Because we have to use probabilistic language to describe the, the guarantee. Right? And then to derive such a guarantee, what is the fundamental assumption made by the condition learning theory? What is the fundamental? Mm -hmm. The training data is from the same distribution of the future data and so on. Yeah, yeah, excellent, right? Great answer. Yeah. We have made the fun fundamental assumption that the training data are coming from the same distribution. The training data tested from the same distribution, right? Otherwise, if this data is really totally different, you can only know the performance of on your training data. You cannot make connection between the training error to the generalization error, right? Then you cannot give any guarantee, right? But this, but this assumption is actually not that like uh, ideal, right? This is quite practical. In many applications, we are uh, we, we we are totally reasonable to assume we use some training data sample from some data distribution to train a classifier and then predict the future examples coming from same distribution. So this practical is it's pretty reasonable. But of course, you can make some extra assumptions that the, the test data are not coming from the same data distribution from the training data, but they have some connections. That you make more general assumptions. So this is a, another field of machine learning called transfer learning. But we're not going to talk about that point, uh, that topic. And then this is uh, all the basic point of, uh, of uh, generation. Only when you understand those basic, when you capture those uh, basic point, you will not be surprised by those uh, long, and tedious uh, pack learning results. You will, you will, you will become, you will get used to them. Right? You will feel comfortable about those results. And then we introduce the very classical framework called probably approximate correct learning, the pack learning, right? And to uh, introduce pack learning, we first give a detailed analysis for, for learning task. We want to learn a simple conjunction out of uh, like n blue variables. We use a so-called elimination algorithm, right? If you still have some impression on that. And we prove that when the number of training examples is bigger than something, bigger than some lower one, we can guarantee that with high probability, that is with at least one minus delta. The delta is some specific probability level. The learned hypothesis by the elimination algorithm has the generation error less than pre specific level epsilon, right? That's our first path learning result. And uh, I, 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 I really hope you, uh, I don't know whether I have done that. Uh, after the class, you should uh, follow the derivation I have shown on the whiteboard to derive that, that result. So if you are familiar with several cases, we have shown in deriving the pack learning result, you'll get you, you you'll get all the key points, all the tricks in deriving the results. And, and then I don't think you will, you have any trouble in solving problems in final exams, at least uh, for computational learning theory problem. So then we uh, introduce the important concept called pack learnable. So what is pack learnable? What is pack learnable? So when we talk about pack learnable. Uh, we're, we're actually talking about a relationship between several things, right? Several objects. So what are the things or objects we're talking about? Are we, are, are we talking about learning some specific target function? Mm. No, right? Then what are we talking about? A class. Yeah, a class, a family of uh, target functions, right? So remember, pack learnability is not talking about some specific target function. We're talking about the class of Target functions, the family of target functions is called concept class, right? So, so when we say pack learnability, we're referring first a family of target target functions called concept class C, right? We also we also assume we have a learning algorithm L, right? Which uses the uh, hypothetical space H, right? And then we say pack learnable is uh, saying C. Concept class C is path learnable by the algorithm L. If what? If what? So what's the definition? What kind of condition is satisfying 
that will contain seeds packed on the ball by air. So first, we need to go through. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you have a high probability of a low probability of error. Yeah. This is just a, a tiny part of the okay. definition, right? right? So this is a very long definition. So the best way to memorize it is that you write it down. You write it down like me, right? I have write it down many times. So to me, I think this is so intuitive, it's so straightforward. Right? If you do it, if you do the same thing like me, you you you, you have the same feeling. Right? So. So we see, the concept class is packed learnable by the algorithm L before every function, every target function that belongs to the concept class C, right? Mm -hmm. And also remember, pack learnable is distribution free. That means for all the data distribution that on the input space X, right? And then we're talking about what kind of conditions when we use algorithm to learn each target function under each possible data distribution, right? That is given any probability level and uh, error level, remember these two levels are always between 0 and 1, right? We say when the algorithm L use M training examples can produce The hypothesis H, a high quality hypothesis H. Why is high quality? Because it can guarantee that the probability, the generation error of H is less than our pre specific level epsilon, with the probability of at least one minus delta, right? So if L uses M training examples can produce such good result hypothesis, then we have a requirement for the skill of M, right? the skill of size of training data. So what's the requirement? Greater than over over epsilon? No. no, this is, oh, okay. we're not talking about any pack learning result right now. We're talking about concept pack learnability, learnability right? Okay. So what's this requirement? This is the key requirement for the definition of pack learnability, right? So when, when M, when such training data size M is polynomial mm -hmm. to four terms, right? Mm -hmm. which, four, which four terms? Mm -hmm. One over epsilon, reciprocal of the error level. One over delta, reciprocal of the probability level. Number of input features, right? And size of, size of the concept class, right? So basically, what is pack learnability? For any target function, any data distribution, if the algorithm only uses a set of training data which size is only polynomial to these four terms, it can produce a high quality hypothesis H which satisfies this uh, probability guarantee about the generalization error. Then we call L pack learn the concept of C, right? So actually the pack learnability defines the sample complexity, right, the sample complexity. So if we, if we use a reasonable amount of samples can guarantee our learning algorithm produce a high quality hypothesis H. High quality means that it satisfies this uh, probability guarantee about the generation error. Then we say this algorithm can pack the concept of C, right? So what's the usage of the pack learnability. Why do we propose pack learnability? We have discussed this point before, right? So now that we want to use a generalization error to evaluate our learning algorithm, the goodness of the learning algorithm, right? So we want to define a set of a good batch learning algorithm. So what kind of batch learning algorithm can we think is good? The one which can pack learn the concept class, right? So the one which does not use too much, too many examples, only uses some examples polynomial to these four terms, we can produce the satisfactory hypothesis. Then we say this algorithm is good algorithm. 
So packet vulnerability actually defines a set of uh, good batch learning algorithm. Right? This is very similar to the concept mystic bound theorem, mystic bound algorithm in the mystic driven learning algorithm, right? So mystic bound algorithm says if the if your mystic driven learning algorithm uh, makes the maximum number of mistakes made by algorithm is uh, polynomial to the number of input features, then we say this algorithm is mystic bound algorithm. So actually it defines a set of uh, good mystic driven learning algorithm, right? So similarly, pack learning maybe defines a set of uh, good batch learning algorithm. But we have uh, more comprehensive uh, considerations about the goodness of learning algorithm. This is about the sample complexity, right? We think if the sample complexity is reasonable, then we think this algorithm is good, right? But also we need to consider the computation cost, right? So, in, so, so for all for, for, for all the algorithms which can pack around the concept class A, then we further define a subset of algorithm which can efficiently pack learn pack learn the concept class A, right? So what is the efficient what's the concept of efficiently pack learn? That's regarding the computation cost, right? Mm -hmm. So first, if the concept class A is can be pack learned L, right? Pack learned by our algorithm. The second, we further require the time complexity for our learning algorithm to generate this hypothesis is also polynomial to the four terms. Mm -hmm. So basically, we require both polynomial sample complexity and both polynomial time complexity. Then we say the algorithm can efficiently pack learn the concept class, right? So this is a definition for efficiently pack learn. Right? So this is a very uh, uh, important concept. I hope everyone of you really understand its meaning, right? So, and um, I think the, 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 non, the, the non, non thing is that the actual definition is so long, right? So we have to write it down by ourselves. And then, After that, we introduce uh, some path learning results. We will use consistent learners. Okay? So what are consistent learners? What are consistent learners? So consistent learners means that our learning algorithm will always produce a hypothesis which is consistent with training data, right? So what does it mean by being consistent with training data? Consistent hypothesis 
That means uh, H is consistent. With training data, has a general generalization error less than epsilon. If the number of training examples is bigger than one over epsilon times logarithm of size of a hypothetical space plus logarithm of uh, one over delta, this uh, probability level, right? So in other words, as long as the number of training examples is bigger than this term, right? We can claim that the generation error of a consistent hypothesis is less than epsilon with large probability. Right? The large probability means that the probability is at least one minus delta. This is our hard learning result. Basically, say it says when our sample complexity is satisfied with some condition, we can claim our consistent learner will have a very small generation error with high probability. This is the result for our pack learning result on consistent learners. And then we associate this pack learning result with the Occam's Reserves Principle. Right? So which term is the sample complexity term can make us associate with Occam's Reserves Principle? Which term? Which? Um, Any other idea? Yeah, this term, right? Logarithm of size of the hypothesis space H, right? Because the size of the hypothesis H represents the complexity of your learning algorithm, represents the complexity of your of learning model, right? And actually, in our homework, there's a problem asking you to write your understanding of the how the Occam's Reason principle can be reflected from this uh, path learning result, right? So here, I do not want to explain. I leave this problem for you. I want you to use your own language to explain why, based on this path learning result, we can conclude that we favor more, more simpler hypothesis, means that we favor smaller hypothesis space. If, uh, Different half of this space can uh, can can all generate a consistent um, classifier or half of this. So this is our pack learning result when we consider only the consistent learners. And then based on this result, we discuss several positive and negative learnability results, right? So. Uh, we consider several concept classes, including conjunctions, disjunctions, uh, three CNF sets, and etc. Right? And we assume for all those uh, concept classes, there is a consistent learner. I want to say whether they are pack learnable. Right? So it's very easy. We just we just use this uh, sample complexity bound to determine whether they are pack learnable. And I think a, uh, one negative res result you should be uh, aware is that the concept class of uh, all Bloom functions is actually not pack learnable. The reason, what's the reason? The reason is that the hypothesis space is too large. So this is also another problem in the homework, and you should, uh, you should check, check that. Right? So that's pretty much what we have discussed so far in the computational learning theory. And today, we are introducing uh, a new setting. We are trying to derive some path learning result under this new learning setting called agnostic learning. So what is agnostic learning? <coughs> Let us first uh, consider what is the general setting for batch learning so far, right? So right now, all the path learning results and our connection to Occam's Razors are all talking about how good we will classify that is consistent on the training set. Right? That is about consistent learning, consistent classifiers, right? So actually, those results are based on two assumptions. The first assumption is that the training and test example come from same, same distribution. That's the fundamental assumption we use to, to develop a whole 
computation learning theory framework, right? But the second assumption is a specialized for the current result. That is, for any concept, there is some function in the hyperfield space that is consistent with the trained data. And I assume our learner can always return such a hyperfield, right? So now we need to consider whether this second assumption is reasonable or, or not. Is it reasonable? Why? Is why, why, why it is reasonable or why it's not reasonable? Is it, hmm? it seems like it's not very reasonable. Um, we spent a lot of time with things that were either linear or really acceptable or not. And <coughs> I know this isn't directly related, but it just seems like for anything more complex than a trivial data set or something like M of N rules, um, it's unlikely that we're guaranteed to find a consistent hypothesis. I just think we'll find something that's close to consistent. Yeah, your intuition is correct. Right? So let me give you a more uh, explicit uh, explanation. So this is far from more practical applications. Why? Because in many times, we cannot identify a proper concept class which contains the perfect function. Why? So consider an example. Suppose we have read the financial report of a listed company, and we are extracting a set of a large number of features, and we want to use these features to predict the stock price of this listed company, say, tomorrow. Right? So this function, as far as knowledge, could be highly nonlinear, highly complex, right? But can you cat categorize this function? Can you find out the family we can attribute this function to? It is very hard, right? So can you claim that this complex target function is a second order polynomial, three order polynomial? No, we can't, right? Because you do not know the parametric form of this function, right? We cannot. We can also not conclude that this function, say, is a combination of sine and cosine. We do not know whether this function is some, uh, say, implicit function by solving some PDEs. It's very hard for us to know the class of, of this company functions, right? But to learn one specific target function, we still need to design a learning algorithm. We still need to choose a hypothesis, space H, right? Then what's the consequence? Remember, we have no idea about the underlying concept class which contain the target function, but we still need to choose a hypothetical space. Then what's the consequence? The consequence is that the consequence is that maybe this is our hypothetical space chosen by a learning algorithm, but the target function could be here, right? And the underlying concept class could be here, right? Or maybe the target function here, and the, con and the concept class could be here, right? So we cannot ensure that the concept class, the, the, tar the, 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 the hypothetical space will contain the concept class, right? Will contain the target function. It is, it is totally possible that the concept class only partially overlaps with the hypothetical space learn, uh, chosen by a learning algorithm. It is possible that the concept class does not overlap with the uh, hypothetical space in your learning algorithm, right? So this is the reality. So now we can say previously we assume if we assume a consistent learners, for any set of trained data, we guarantee our learning algorithm will produce a consistent hypothesis or classifier. So usually, we are sure that the hypothesis space H contain the concept class, right? Or many times we just uh, assume H is equal to C, right? But in realistic settings, because we have no idea what are the explicit 
concept class which contains the party function. So it's very possible that the, top, the concept class just partially overlaps our, our chosen hypothesis space H, right? And the, 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 the target function could be outside of our hypothesis space. So this setting is called agnostic learning. And now, under this more realistic setting, that is agnostic learning, can we still say something about the generalization performance of our learning hypothesis from this hypothesis space H? This is our goal, right? To fulfill this goal, we must uh, address two problems. First, under agnostic learning, can we still derive some guarantee which is similar to the guarantee we have derived using consistent learners. So remember, what kind of guarantee we describe for our consistent learners? That is uh, some conclusion directly about the value of the generation error, right? We claim there is a high probability the generation error, the generation error is less than some uh, pre-specific level if some sample complexity constraint is uh, satisfied, right? So now, on the agnostic learning, can we still derive some condition that we can claim similar guarantee? We are not sure about this point. Right? And second, suppose we have some guarantee, and then what kind of conditions can lead to this guarantee? Can give us guarantee, right? Is this condition have a similar form to what we have derived for consistent learners. This is the second point. Right? So to address these uh, two points, let us first consider on the agnostic learning, what's the performance of our learning hypothesis on training data? So are we still, uh, are we guaranteed that the training error still is zero? No, right? Why? Because, because it's possible that the target function is outside the, 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 the hypothesis space, right? So for specific uh, training data, we know that the target function must have a zero training error, right? And perhaps uh, several hypotheses which are close enough to the target function can also give the same zero training error, right? But if all of those consistent hypotheses are outside our hypothetical space, then no matter how smart your learning algorithm is, you pick up <coughs> any hypothesis from big H, it will result in a non-zero training error. Right? So on the agnostic learning, we are not guaranteed to have a zero training error. And then, what is our learning goal? What is our, our goal of design learning algorithm? And here I can tell you, the goal is pretty simple. Now that we cannot guarantee a zero training error, then we try to find out a hypothesis to have a, a training error as small as possible. Why? Let me, <coughs> let, let us put aside this um, question. Let, let us keep this question in mind. Why we should uh, uh, still set up our learning goal to have a uh, Small training to have a, a, a training error as small as, as small as possible. Let us try to answer this question later. Right? So first, let us uh, review what is the training error. What is the training error? How do we define the training error? So use uh, human language. We can simply say the training error is a fraction of training examples that are misclassified by our learned hypothesis, right? So now if you write if you write down mathematical definition, how can we express the training error? So this is uh, H is our learned hypothesis. So the training error can be write down as the one over the number of training examples M, right? Times the count of the misclassified number of examples, right? So how, how can we express the count of uh, misclassified examples? 
we can go through all the training examples, right? X1 to XM, right? And then we use an indicator function to indicate whether our prediction from our learned hypothesis is different from uh, its true label, which is actually the prediction from target function, right? So this is an indicator function either is zero or one, right? So if this indicator function is one, meaning that the prediction is different from the true label, then we get one count, right? And then we go through all of the examples and we sum all the non-zero values, we get a count of a misclassified sum. Hmm? Um, sorry, could you just say what M is again? Is that the size of the training set? Yeah, M is the size of the training set. Oh, okay, cool. Yes. Yeah. So this is a mathematical definition for the training error, right? Very simple. No question about this, right? Yeah, and then, this is the training error. And now, actually we are most concerned of about the generalization error, right? So what's the gen what's the definition for generalization error? Or true error? What's the definition for true error? The true error is defined as uh, the probability that the prediction for a sample example from the data distribution D is different from its true label, which is a prediction of the target function, right? So it's simple the probability that we make wrong prediction. So now, we want to discuss the connections between the two types of errors. So first, let us look at the generalization error or true error, right? So given your learned hypothesis H, given the data distribution D, and given the target function, what can we say about the true error? What can we say is that this true error is constant, fixed constant, right? Because it's a simple probability, right? So it's a fixed constant. And now, can we give the same conclusion for the trinium? So given H, given the data distribution D, and given the target function, can we say the training error is a fixed constant as well? No, why? The training set is random. Yeah, perfect, right? So remember, the training error is defined on the training data, right? So each training data, xi, is sampled from the data distribution D, right? So essentially, the training error is a random variable. We can also see this point from the definition, from its mathematical definition, right? So we can look at the summation here for each indicator function. <coughs> Inside this, each indicator function, each xi is a random variable, right? Remember, it is sampled from the data distribution D. And now, a function of a random variable is, is a random variable as well, right? And then the summation of set of random variables is also a random variable. So the training error is a random variable. This is a very important point, right? And then, how can we make connections between a random variable, that is the training error, and uh, the fixed constant, the true error? What's, what's their connection? Same expected value. What? They have the same expected value. Same expected value. <laughs> and other idea? So you are very close to the answer. So, but remember, this is a fixed constant. It's meaning to talk about it. It's an expectation, right? Expectation is itself, right? But this is a random variable. It is meaningful to talk about the expectation of a random variable, right? So we can easily see that the expectation or the mean of the training error is exactly the true error or the generalization error. Why? We can calculate, right? We can calculate. So according to this definition, right? So the expectation of uh, <coughs> the training error, because it is one over m, right? Because it is a summation of set of uh, 
random variables. So expectation is a summation of their own respective expectations, right? So this is expectation of each indicator function that HSI different from FXI, right? So then what's the expectation for this uh, indicator function? So first, this indicator function is a binary variable, right? It is an algorithm, algorithm, zeros, one, right? And then we should look at the probability that this indicator function is one, right? So what's the probability that this indicator function, function is one? It's true error. Yeah, it's true error, because only when each side it's different from fxi, the indicator function is 1, right? So it is essentially the probability that we make a wrong prediction on xi, right? Rem remember, xi come from the data distribution D, right? So it, it is the exact definition for the true error, the generation error. So this probability is simply the true error, right? And also, you can check that an expectation of a binary variable is simply the probability of that binary variable is 1. So then the expectation for this uh, indicator function is simply the uh, generation error. And then you, s you sum up m generation error and then divide it by m, then we get the expectation is uh, the true error, the generation error, right? It's very simple. So now we can make a connection back. We know that this generation error is the expectation of the training error. Or in other words, we can say the training error is the empirical estimate of this uh, generalization error, right? So now, if you have some, I guess we all have some uh, um, basic knowledge that one random variable has low probability to be very far away from its expectation, right? If I'm taking some basic courses in probability of statistics, that's the first conclusion we have learned from all kinds of distributions, right? So now, based on this uh, uh, knowledge, what we want is that can we quantify the probability of the distance between the training error and uh, the generation error, the true error, right? We know that with high probability, the true error will be close to the training error, right? So now, if we can guarantee the training error is very small, because the true error is quite close to the training error, then we can claim that the true error be, will be small as well. So that's our whole logic, that's our whole strategy to develop a path guarantee, a path learning result for agnostic learning. That is, we want to find out a guarantee that if a hypothesis with small training error, then it will also have a good accuracy on future C examples, namely small true error, right? So now we can see why we want to set up our learning goal is to find out a hypothesis with small training error as small as possible, right? Because we want to plumb the probability that the true, the true error to be close to the training error with high probability. And then if our training error is small, then with high probability, the true error will be small as well, right? Because it's close to the training error. So now you can see it's pretty reasonable for us to set up learning goal to find out a hypothesis with very small training error. Right? So this is a basic uh, our idea to derive the path learning results for agnostic learning. So now how can we find the probability about the distance between the training error and true error? That is a, a random variable and its expectation. Right? How can we bound that? If you have taken the basic probability and statistic courses, we know that we'll utilize the tails of the distributions. We must have a 
learn some uh, similar technologies. Say this is a, this is our random variables, and then to decide the probability that this random variable is so far away from its mean, we need to utilize the distribution mass on those tails. Right? Okay, let us stop. Right now, we give a general framework, a general idea to derive the results for agnostic learning, and uh, on Wednesday we'll give the detailed results.